Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second day of South by Southwest Eco. I'm Tracy Mann. I work in the community engagement for the conference. Very happy to have you here for a truly special presentation here this morning. Um, rather than give you sort of the bios of the speakers which you have in your material, I just want to set the session up by telling you that uh, I was chatting earlier with the panelists, and, and what we talked about really was the spirit of collaboration that you're going to see manifested in this discussion this morning. The spirit of uh, coming together from conservation as well as aquaculture, aquaculture, to have the kind of conversations that haven't been had previously. And this is really what we want this conference to be about for you, the participants, that new conversations are sparked and that people come out of traditional silos around environmental and sustainability issues to really create new and dynamic opportunities for the future. So I'm very pleased to uh, present the distinguished folks you're going to hear see here this morning. I would be remiss if I didn't plug uh, that Ms. Sylvia Earle will also be our keynote speaker this afternoon at 2 p.m. We'll help you come back and join us for that and also take advantage of a lot of the great content we have today on oceans and water. Thank you. Let's welcome our panelists. So, welcome. Thanks for coming. Congratulations uh, getting up so early. Um, so, we're going to be talking about fish today, and um, we've got a fantastic panel here. Very varied and interesting bunch. Um, so, er as everyone knows, there's a clear problem of um, a lack of fish in the world. We've been taking far too many fish out of the ocean, uh, the fish can't replenish itself. Um, sometime in the mid-1990s, we reached uh, peak, fish, peak fish worldwide, and after which uh, fish stocks have started to decline. Um, it's a particular problem with large fish, uh, Atlantic salmon, tuna, halibut, uh, swordfish, uh, estimated to be 90% gone already and uh, could be completely extinct in a few years. Um, so one solution is to stop overfishing so the fish can replenish itself, and another obvious answer is to turn to aquaculture, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So um, out of 158 million tons of fish consumed worldwide, 67 million tons of that already comes from fish farms. But there's no question that we'll have to increase as time goes on. Um, the World Resources Institute says we may need to double fish farm production by 2050. So. But we also know that aquaculture comes with a lot of its own uh, problems from the pollution, antibiotics, uh, from, from the food that goes into these facilities, all, all problems. Um, so we know we need aquaculture, but, um, and the question isn't whether we need it, um, but it's how it can be done sustainably. So that's what we're really going to be talking about. So let's introduce the, the panelists. And um, Dr. Sylvia Earle is uh, preeminent um, figure in her, in her field. Um, she's a National Geographic Society explorer in residence, a TED Prize winner, a Time Hero for the Planet. Uh, she's been on 100 expeditions and logged 7,000 hours underwater, which is an extraordinary amount of time. Um, she was also telling us last night at dinner, we all had dinner last night, that um, she started an aquaculture business with her husband back in the 60s, which is long before anyone else. Um, was doing that, and she also said I, I thought it was interesting that she was a uh, chief scientist at NOAA for a time where she was known as the Sturgeon General <laughs> for her stickability and uh, feistiness, I guess. Uh, turning now to, to Mike Vellings, um, who actually doesn't have a background in fish, but maybe that's a, a blessing because he brings a kind of entrepreneurial perspective to it, uh, a kind of a, a fresh um, idea. Um, he's co-founder with uh, his partner and former TED Prize director, Amy Novogratz, sitting here in the 
front row here, uh, uh, co-founder of Aquaspark, which uh, is the first investment fund to focus on sustainable aquaculture. Um, and he'll be telling us, obviously, much more about that, but they invest in uh, technologies and businesses transforming the future of fish and aquatic farming. Uh, we turn now to Eric Schwab, who's um, Chief Conservation Officer for the National Aquarium. Uh, he was also at uh, NOAA for a time, um, overseeing fisheries and uh, coastal conservation efforts. Um, and he's also doing some interesting work at um, uh, uh, so the, the National Aquarium now. They're setting up some uh, prototype pilots, is that right? Of Sustainable seafood program. Yeah. Um, and finally, we turn to Bo Perry here, who's uh, doing extremely interesting things in agriculture, but not actually in fish. He's growing uh, seaweed out in uh, farms in, uh, in Mexico and um, providing kits for um, local fishermen to uh, move away from wild fishing to do this new type of aquaculture. So it's extremely interesting. Um, and he can bring a more of a, uh, one of his arguments is that we, we need to, if, if, we, if we want to expect um, fishermen to give up wild fishing, we need to uh, give them some other social purpose, some other job, so that's, that's, that's what his perspective is. So we're going to start now with Sylvia, who's going to give us a kind of state of the oceans to set the scene for, for us, so I'll turn it over to you, Sylvia. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak for the ocean and an issue whose time I think is overdue. It's not just that it has come the idea of looking at what we like to eat and looking at the sources that really, of food that really sustain us. That is to look at creatures from the fresh waters and ocean as either uh, objects of our desire choices, like sturgeon as caviar or tuna from the ocean these are choices, not necessarily, not, not really necessities. And then there's food security. How do we feed seven billion people with a planet that hasn't grown since humans arrived many years ago? Uh, we have drawn down the assets on the land and in the sea to, to really make our prosperity possible. But here's the thing, and the reason I'm really pleased that we're focusing on this issue right now. We are at a pivotal point in history, human history, maybe the history of life on Earth, because for the first time, there is a species, that would be us, with a capacity to change the nature of nature. We're doing it. The evidence is all around. We're the only creatures on Earth as smart as others are. There are smart elephants, smart birds, smart cats, dogs, horses, lots of other creatures with minds that are, have, you know, they're, they're smart animals, but they can't see what humans can see to reach back into the past, to know how old the Earth is, to have been up in the sky and deep in the depths of the ocean, and to put it all together and to communicate on the scale that humans are now capable of doing. Kids carry around in their pockets access to knowledge that is unprecedented. Smart people in the past, Copernicus, Galileo, Einstein, you name the heroes with big brains of the past, could not know what kids now can know because we're the beneficiaries of all preceding investigations that are now gathered together and now we can see we are at a pivotal point. We have choices to continue doing what humans have always done, consume the natural world as if it will never run out, to use all of the natural systems as if that's what they're here to do, to serve our short-term purposes. But now we know that if humans are to have an enduring future on this living planet, we have to get a lot smarter, use the knowledge that we've got to really secure a place for ourselves within the natural systems that are already heavily stressed from now all preceding time, especially, especially the last half century, armed with technologies that did not exist even when I was a kid. So 
the challenge right now that we'll talk about here today really zeroes in on that big question, how are we going to feed seven billion people and more and to serve the desires that we have, food choices, as well as the absolute needs that people have that would be food security and where in all of this big spectrum of food do aquatic animals fit in? It's mainly a choice, principally not a necessity. And that's what we need to explore today. So pleased to be part of the action. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Mike? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm Mike Veiling, Zwaar um, uh, What Sylvia just said is that if we don't change our ways, then and, um, um, and there won't be a lot of fish left. And, and not many people know, and um, uh, Ben already pointed it out a little bit, um, what is actually happening um, in, on the demand side. Um, and we currently take about 65 million tons globally, every single fishing vessel combined out of the ocean for human consumption. Um, um, and if you look at the, the increase in demand in the next 30 years, that's about 80, 80 million tons. That's uh, like one and a half times as much as we currently take out of the ocean. That's definitely not gonna, um, uh, going to come out of the ocean uh, with wildcard fisheries. The only way forward is farming. Um, but the, the numbers are so staggering, it's unbelievable. Um, and that's why we founded Aquaspark. Um, and there's, aquaculture has a, a really bad reputation on the one hand. On the other hand, there's a lot of really exciting stuff going on. Um, this industry is going to double in the next um, uh, 30 years. And as Sylvia, Sylvia said, we are at a pivotal point where we can really make sure that we don't make the same mistakes as we did in all the other industries. So we are going to make investments in sustainable companies that we can make even better and do it in such a way that, we'll, that that will create a following um, throughout the industry and make sure that we help this industry go and, and, and develop in a much more sustainable way that we can um, uh, sus sustain for the next couple of hundred years. And, um, uh, thank you, Ben. Great. Thank you, Mike. Eric? Thank you, Ben. Uh, thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here with you and with these panelists on such an important topic. Uh, I would just want to touch on three things very quickly. First, uh, the topic of the day, fish farming, futile or the future. Uh, I'll submit to you that it is certainly not futile and it is certainly not solely restricted to the future. As we have already heard here uh, today, it's here now. Growth is inevitable, and the only questions before us are ultimately uh, what we're going to grow, where we're going to grow it, how it's going to be grown, by whom, and how much. And fundamentally, those are the questions that are in front of us. The second question is, um, another major focus of today's discussion will be around some of the environmental challenges associated with uh, not only the fish farming of today, but the fish farming of the future. And legitimate questions do exist in many parts of the world and here in this country around impacts to water quality, benthic impacts, impacts to local uh, wild fish stocks, uh, feed sources, contaminants, and the like. But fundamentally, while we strive to do this better, we need to also keep in mind one important question, and that is, as we look at the environmental concerns associated with fish farming, we have to look at them in the right context. Compared to what? Uh, compared to agriculture, compared to further uh, pressures on our wild stocks, uh, in many parts of um, our food system, uh, we have challenges that are equally, if not more significant, than those that we face in the aquaculture arena. Uh, the challenges are significant, uh, but we have to keep them uh, in the right context as we seek to feed uh, seven going to nine billion people around the world. Uh, the third thing that I want to say is, uh, you know, why National Aquarium? Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time, and I know in the Q&A we'll uh, have an opportunity to talk a little bit about my past work with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Uh, but I went to the National Aquarium because we have an opportunity to connect with people in a real world way. Uh, one component of that is a sustainable seafood initiative that we are developing 
it is, its focus will be on delivery of integrated local sourced seafood, both aquaculture product and sustainable wild harvest product into local markets in ways that can, we think, uh, begin not only to address many of these challenges, but to begin to help people understand their power in the marketplace uh, to make seafood buying decisions that are responsible and, and to make food buying decisions that are responsible and impactful, uh, but also to help them understand their place in relation to the world's oceans. Uh, we know that people need to be more engaged around the health of our local waterways, the health of our oceans, and obviously one very important and, and meaningful and impactful way to do that is uh, by connecting up with people through their retail seafood buying choices. Uh, look forward to the discussion that will ensue. Thank you. Great. Bo, you want to finish us off? Sure. Uh, I'm also thrilled to be here. I'm really pleased with the uh, interest. Great to be on a panel with, uh, I think, some diverse voices in the sector. Um, and hopefully what I can talk about a bit is, is the actual farm uh, operations. First, I want to just say I have a small problem with the title of this panel and that it's fish farming. And the truth is aquaculture encompasses much more than that. Shrimp is actually the number one uh, marine seafood uh, aquaculture product. It's about $15 billion a year. Um, and of course, they're bivalves. I work in seaweed. I've worked in fin fish and shrimp uh, bivalves. I'm, I've sort of gone down the uh, the food chain here, <laughs> and, and there's a logic to that, although it, it sort of dawned on me only recently. Um, but uh, I, I, I think part of this conversation is to uh, open a window into aquaculture, and, and please think of it as a much broader spectrum, just as we have on land, we have plants and animals, and within those two categories, there's great diversity. That's true in, in the oceans as well. Um, and a lot of focus in the development has been at the top of the trophic uh, scale, essentially, i.e. top predators and things that uh, need a lot of inputs to be, to be cultivated. So um, I've focused on the other end of the food chain, which is, which is the base, the, the seaweeds, essentially. Uh, and I also work a bit in bivalves now. Um, I think seaweeds are the most sustainable product uh, on Earth. They require no land, arable land, no fresh water, no fertilizer, no pesticides, if you do it right. Um, and uh, it's really just sunlight and seawater. Um, and it can be used for human food, feed, fertilizer. Um, it has industrial and biomedical applications that are really expanding by the day. People are very uh, working very hard on seaweed cultivation techniques and, and uh, uh, commercial applications. But the, the, the reason I went into seaweed actually uh, has to do with conservation. And I come from uh, sort of a family tradition of marine and land conservationists. And I had seen a real challenge transferring conservation in the land context to the sea. And uh, the real problem there was a lack of livelihoods uh, for fishing communities. You know, you can't just put an artificial line around a piece of water and tell people not to fish there. What you need to do is to come to them with an offer of an alternative. Sylvia talked about uh, seafood or food choices. Well, fishermen don't really have that same luxury of a livelihood choice. And there are 260 million people, give or take, uh, according to the FAO, who rely on this uh, industry for their primary livelihood. Several billion people depend on it for protein. So we need to uh, develop aquaculture that can help fishermen essentially develop an exit strategy from overfishing, um, and, and that's what I do. I, I develop the technical aspects of, aqua, of seaweed aquaculture, and then I try and bring that technology and business opportunity to fishing communities and create networks of, of uh, contract farms that I supply with seed. I buy back their product and sell it. And uh, I'm hoping to bring North American seaweeds uh, uh, to, to North American consumers. We import about 90 percent of our seaweed that we're consuming and we're starting to consume a lot so uh, that seafood deficit United States it's only after oil as a commodity our seafood deficit is uh, 10 12 billion dollars a year something like that so we need to start reversing that as a country and if we're going to do that we should do it uh, from the bottom of the food chain up and hopefully bring these opportunities to fishing communities so that we can um, do
deal with uh, 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 fisheries problems as we develop sustainable aquaculture. That's the connection that I think will allow us to make a substantial leap forward uh, in terms of sustainability. Great. So I wanted to ask you, so I mean, you're working in, uh, on the Mexican coast and uh, you have a fisherman and he's, he's used to going out on his boat every day. He's a big kind of burly macho guy. I mean, how do you persuade him to go into uh, seaweed instead of fishing? Well, I'd, I'd probably rather work with his uh, son or daughter right. is, the, is the short answer. No, old, old fishermen are set in their ways. Um, and, and But I think we're actually at a, at a generational inflection point where fishermen, and this is true around the world. I've traveled quite a bit on several continents, and I, I keep hearing the story over and over again. We can't expect our children as fishermen to support themselves and to support our communities because the fish are not there anymore. So they are uniquely uh, receptive to aquaculture in this moment. But you have to present it to them in a format that they want. And that, in this case, is an independent enterprise. So if I went and I said, I'm gonna, you're going to punch in at 9, you're going to punch out at 5, you're going to work for me and grow seaweed. Not going to happen for a fisherman. That's not the way a fisherman thinks. But if I say, I'm going to help you get set up and become an independent operator, I'm going to sell you seed, I'm going to buy it back. If there's a profit, you get to keep it. You're the captain of your own destiny. That's something that they appreciate, and I've got, had great success with that offer, almost uh, uh, batting a 1,000 with that, at least in terms of getting the conversation of, you know, could we do this with your community? So that, that's maybe the biggest key. The other thing is to do seaweed instead. You know, tuna farmer, tuna fisherman is not going to become a tuna farmer. So give them a business model that is low, oper low startup costs, easy to operate, um, something that maybe is very similar to fishing, which seaweed farming is, you know, um, and, and that's something that they can, they can work with. So that, that's the key, is tailoring your, your offer. Right. Can I weigh in on that? Yeah, well, I was going to ask you, I mean, how sympathetic are you to this, this argument that we need to provide jobs before we can have conservation? Well, the reality is, is this that fishing, hunting, and taking from the sea uh, can continue until they're gone. That's kind of the track that we're on. We've gotten so good using new technologies developed mostly post, during and post World War II and during the time since that really shift the odds from the way that fishing once did occur with nets that were prized, made by hand, out of materials that would dissolve in time if lost at sea. That time has passed. Now nets are made of very durable, low cost compared to times in the past, materials that, that last maybe essentially forever, centuries. And there's incentive just to not try to recover lost nets that go on fishing and complicate and add to the destruction of ocean wildlife. So whatever it is, we kind of have to get over it. The idea that we can continue to take on a large scale, industrial scale, wildlife from the sea as a means of feeding ourselves or developing products such as omega-3 oils. We just have to think and realize that this is wildlife we're talking about, like birds. We used to take birds commercially. I had an uncle who was a market hunter back early in the 20th century. Well, he couldn't do it as a middle-aged man because guess what? The birds were declining at a rate comparable to what is happening to the fish today. And they weren't using the large-scale methods that we now are applying to extracting ocean wildlife. And the bycatch issues and the habitat destruction issues that come when you drag a, a dredge, a net across the ocean floor, taking not just the shrimp or the other bottom dwelling species that you're looking for, you take the whole system. It's like using a bulldozer to catch songbirds. <laughs> you throw most of what's there away. And these are issues that go back 50 years, 40 years, even today. People think, well, the ocean is infinite, well, it'll recover no matter what we, what we take out of it or what we put into it, another complicating factor. And these overarching things combined with the, the, the world is warming. 
We have acidification of the ocean to deal with. The, the, the planet is changing. We can't just look at, through the lens of the way things were when laws that we now still live by were put into place, when we thought that the ocean was too big to fail. It is failing. So the question, what are we going to do about the fishermen? Well, my uncle is not a market hunter <laughs> anymore. Of course, he's not anymore either, but you know, his way of life is gone. The way of fishing can be maintained only if we get a lot smarter about what the reality is concerning how much the ocean can actually produce. And we have to think differently about the economics. Fish, why did they call me the Sturgeon General at the National, at, the, at NOAA? Because I pointed out, much to the consternation of my fellow NOAAans, <laughs> that fish have an accounting base of zero when they're swimming live in the ocean. They're worth, they're, they're, they have zero accounting base. They're free, right? You take them out of the ocean and suddenly they're valuable. I mean, bluefin tuna today have a huge price. They have very few of them left, but what is there has an increased high price, but not when they're swimming in the ocean. Fish should not have an accounting base of zero when they're swimming in the sea, and yet that's how we account for them. We have to change our way of thinking. There, there's another whole value of fish is carbon-based units. These are part of the carbon cycle of the nutrient cycle in the ocean. We need to think of them as more than commodities. What's a bird worth? Well, we think of them with new values today. Living birds, we understand, have a value. Living fish have a value beyond pounds of meat. So we're at this changing attitude and, and perception. I don't have a straight answer about what you're going to do, but other people get out of work, they have to change their, their way of making a living. Um, I do have sympathy for the fishermen. And, and I hope that for especially those who are local fishermen who are feeding their families and their communities, I think they need some special treatment and special care. I don't have a lot of sympathy for the large scale industrial extractors of ocean wildlife because they're just looking at the ocean as not livelihoods, they're commodities. They're just looking at free goods that they can go out with big subsidies that taxpayers get behind to make it more attractive to, you know, exploit the natural world. Good. Can I yes, can I ask a question? I mean, uh, as we seek to build up the aquaculture industry, I mean, what would you say are the, are the main challenges? I mean, you've looked at this from a policy point of view and now it's, it's a practical program. What are the roadblocks? Yeah, so, so let me first weigh in because I think it builds to this question of, of um, community. It also builds to this question of um, sort of the either or aspect of this. You know, I don't think that this is necessarily should be considered as an either or prospect. Um, we are doing a much better job of sustainably managing our wild stocks. We can, we can be a lot smarter, we, ha we can improve the science, we can improve the technologies, and we can continue to derive sustainable wild stock benefit while we continue to, number one, take into account all of these other ecosystem values that um, fish provide for us out there swimming uh, around in the ocean. Um, at the same time that we build aquaculture production into the future. From a community, uh, so I think that what we're, and even if we thought that was a bad idea, we're gonna have wild stock fisheries with us for the foreseeable future. So what we really have to think about is how we, how we maintain responsible, sustainable wild stock fisheries while we build aquaculture production that is responsible and sustainable. And that integration occurs both globally as well as at the community level. So uh, part of my response um, to this community question is that um, fishermen will respond to economic opportunities and we're not asking them necessarily in a lot of cases to stop doing this and start doing this. We're saying you can supplement some of what you have lost um, from more constraints that are, that are imposed around wild stocks with engagement around some of these aquaculture 
opportunities. And um, those opportunities uh, provide economic value to you that will allow you to, to invest more and more as we go forward and accrue community benefits. And oh, by the way, one of the really important things, whether we're talking about wild stocks or healthy local waters to support aquaculture production is that communities are invested in the health of those oceans, that are invested in the health of those waterways in ways that they have not necessarily been historically because of the economic value that they derive there. Now, which takes me all the way around, Ben, and I apologize for that uh, circuitous route, to your question of regulatory constraints. You know, one of the challenges that we have in the U.S. is um, that we've often and historically looked askance at aquaculture to the point that we have um, regulatory systems that um, create significant hurdles to, um, to Im implementation of aquaculture. And as a result, most of our aquaculture product is being imported from places where, um, in many cases, they do a great job. In some cases, they clearly don't do as good a job as we would do here, notwithstanding, you know, the carbon impacts of growing things in um, distant parts of the world and consuming them here. So we're losing the economic opportunity in our communities, and we are exporting, um, in some cases, more damaging environmental impacts um, because of our current regulatory system. And one of the big challenges that we have, and it happens at the local level um, with, with planning and zoning, it happens at the state level with regulatory requirements in state waters, and it happens at the federal level um, with federal uh, environmental constraints and, and federal waters constraints. We have, to, we have to bring that together so that we can put um, U.S. aquaculture production opportunities on a level playing field with other parts of the world. Good. What? Yeah, the, <coughs> when the, you asked what, what the uh, biggest problems are of this industry and the biggest challenges, and, and it hooks straight into what Sylvia was saying. Uh, most aquaculture operations use, in, in, their fish, uh, in their fish feed, um, use fish, a wild caught fish, and that's sardines, manhaden, um, anchovies. Um, those fisheries are, well, heavily restrained in that they are um, uh, at the peak level of what they can take out of the ocean, it's definitely not going to grow. And in many cases, that's heavily overfished. It's one of the most, well, for in, in a large part, one of the most unsustainable fisheries we have. We need two times as much. Um, that's not going to come out of the ocean, and, and, and that's one of the biggest challenges. There are, however, really great opportunities around. Um, insect farming could be a good replacement, algae farming, um, seaweed farming, as Bo just said, um, bacteria, um, um, and, and, and there's great alternatives, um, and, 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 and there's other issues. Uh, like um, if you look at feed, uh, a lot of people advertise soy as a really great replacement for fish meal and fish oil. Well, if you feed salmon soy um, without any additive, the salmon explodes. Um, that's how healthy soy is. Um, um, and we have really big challenges if we want accessible, healthy, healthy food for people. And, there's, there's, a, there's, there's a ton of opportunities around, but that's one of the biggest issues that needs to be solved. And it's one of our biggest um, focus points with Aquaspark. Let me just ask one more question about Aquaspark. I mean, what is your process for deciding what to invest in? Uh, what, what, what sort of opportunities are you interested in? Um, well, we look all across the value chain, and we look um, at, at aquaculture in a very broad range. So crustaceans, shellfish, seaweed, uh, but also fish, and then fish, we look at um, species that have a, um, a sensible food conversion ratio. As Eric just said, if you compare it to, um, um, and to other um, agriculture, um, and we think it needs to make sense, and fish is a great choice if done well and, um, and if it's the right species. So we go for species that typically have a food conversion ratio um, and that's smaller than chicken, where we try to replace fish meal, fish oil, and soy in the diet to make it really sustainable. And then we invest in feed, in technology, in seaweed around fish cages to uh, create extra revenue and make, a, make an operation cleaner, um, in market access, um, so we can go to a fish farmer anywhere in the world um, and say, hey, you're doing something exceptional. We would love to, um, uh, um, uh, to highlight that and give you a money investment. We have 50 of the world's best experts working with us to make your company better over time, to look at your bootstrap program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then um, we'll help you with access to sustainable feed and to implement that because it's not easy. Um, uh, and we'll help you with access to all kinds of technology and we'll help you sell your fish. 
and then create a long-term partnership, create this whole ecosystem of um, companies all over the globe um, that do this in the right way. One thing that really helps shape the, the nature of the aquaculture issues is having closed systems versus open, that is open ocean or coastal aquaculture where you really rely on the natural ocean or fresh water in some cases to dilute the pollution or to serve as a source of food or, or whatever. But again, thinking about accounting, the ocean real estate we think of as free, you know? You, you have to buy the land and pay taxes if you're land-based in the ocean. It's free, but it really shouldn't be regarded as free because it comes out of the global commons. Every one of us has a vested interest in what happens to the global commons to the ocean, to the skies above, to the fabric of life itself. So right now, we're not properly accounting for the real cost of the wild fish that goes into feeding cultivated fish. It's not a good business model to take, as you point out, Mike, uh, this many wild fish to make this many farm fish. No matter how you crunch the numbers, it doesn't work. But we think of these fish as free. All you have to do is go catch them. And, and that somehow isn't, in, in, the, in the end, we're going to pay one way or the other. Uh, those fish have a value that because we don't have to pay for it right now, we will ultimately see the, the cost, the real cost. So 1973, I had a chance to visit China and see essentially closed system aquaculture. It was on a com commune, or several actually, where they had ponds where they raised several species of plant-eating fish, carp. Now those several species didn't eat the same kinds of plants. Some went for the, the microscopic ones. Some went for the, the, the crunchy macro plants, uh, ate water lilies and such. But anyway, they were all in the pond. The ducks were cultivated on the surface. The ducks pooped added nutrients to the waters. The fish also added nutrients once they consumed. And, and all around the edges, there were mulberry trees that were soaking up the nutrients, producing leaves that fed silkworms that were part of the product. And there was a garden that also soaked up nutrients. So literally nothing was wasted. It was all sort of contained within a relatively small area, producing vegetables, producing eggs, producing ducks, producing mulberries, producing silk, silkworms, all in a pretty small area. Work, it, you know, this is a product of more than a thousand years of fine tuning. How do you feed people most efficiently in small areas? More crop per drop is the byword. It's water, it's water in the end, whether it's ocean water or fresh water. You have to think about the real cost of what goes into making a system function and, and the nutrients, what you put in, what you take out. And, you know, most of the open ocean aquaculture doesn't think, they're, they're not set up to take into account the, the real cost of, of what these operations are, are require. I think we have to get better if we're going to be successful. Uh, also in China, open ocean aquaculture with laminaria that this is in uh, a highly polluted area but part of the rationale was those laminaria big brown kelp algae soak up the pollutants they take them up and you might not want to eat <laughs> the kelp that has been grown in a highly polluted area but here was the benefit it they took up some of the of the pollutants and the products that came from that can be used for industrial applications, not just for a source of food. So, you know, we're at this crossroads again of looking at the whole planet and how it functions and how can aquaculture fit in somehow in the many ways, sources of food, how do we do it, closed systems versus open systems. I, I think, Mike, you, 
and Amy with AquaSpark are doing something really critically important, and that is to evaluate, in an overall sense, what works and what doesn't, and where can we apply our minds at this stage to good advantage and invest in those smart aquaculture. There's a lot of dumb aquaculture going on out there that we need to move away from and more into areas where we really account for what is the real cost and to think, are there ways that we can adapt the model of closed systems that work for some of the microalgae where you grow in inland fresh water, but you're, I mean, salt water, but inland, or in some cases, fresh water inland to maximize the foot, the, the yield for a minimum input. Isn't that the goal for sustainable um, <laughs> business? Um, and to think, can there be ways to adopt the aquarium approach uh, for saltwater plants and animals that are actually grown on the land instead of, instead of relying on ocean space? Can I mean, look at tropical fish. Another thing, not for eating purposes, but there's big business in fish as pets. <laughs> if you can get it right, that, that's, a, that's something that fishermen could do and start raising fish to supply all those aquariums that are probably half the people in this room have some fish in their house, not to eat, but to feed. Anyway. Good. Eric, you want to say something? Well, I, I, I think Sylvia makes a really important point in that we think about, we shouldn't think about aquaculture monolithically. You know, Bo has already talked about seaweed production, which has, you know, minimal um, implications for in, in open water environment. Shellfish, uh, and I should say not minimal, but probably Hot. beneficial, yes. Shellfish, the same way, um, as long as they're sited in the right way and the proper constraints are in, in, in place. You know, shellfish aquaculture in Chesapeake Bay region, growing by leaps and bounds, um, in many ways replacing functionally um, lost wild stock oyster populations. Um, we have closed system opportunities um, that are real in many places. Some of those are ponds, some of those are in warehouses. Um, and so we, I think an important takeaway from the comment that you just made is, you know, a reminder to all of us to not to think about this um, as, you know, as if all aquaculture fit in the same box. And all impacts are not the same. Um, and we can manage many of these impacts, whether they be in open water environments or in closed systems, in ways like you know Mike has discussed. And um, you know, an AquaSpark's engagement around some of these feed issues is an incredibly important part of getting aquaculture right going forward. Um, there are many other components to that. Um, so thinking about this in sort of a more um, a, a more complex and dynamic way is, I think, an important part of this conversation. You want to say something? Yeah, I, I'm thinking as this conversation uh, evolves about the fact, why is there so much dumb aquaculture? And the answer is that it's really, really hard. <laughs> it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of time, and after $5 million in five years of trying to grow a certain fish, people tend to scuttle <laughs> the sustainability uh, uh, agenda. Uh, and so the people who survive are the ones who tend to take the shortcuts, and that's the product of a whole bunch of economic realities. But that need not be the case going forward, and hopefully what you're getting from this panel is the sense that it's not these one-offs that are gonna trend towards stupid, but it's a collaborative effort, it's a movement, it's a multidisciplinary, multi-sector, really. It's, aquaculture is actually a series of sectors. Uh, it needs to be synchronized, and if you want sustainability, it, we need to seize the mantle here, like in the United States or as sustainability advocates. We need to, we need to establish a presence and a role here or uh, risk seeding the design and, and the form of aquaculture to places that don't really care about these things as much or, or people who don't care about them as much. So to maybe give a big picture uh, of where we need to go, we need a lot of money, we need a lot of smart people, maybe people who 
don't come from aquaculture originally, but who have a strong grounding in community uh, farming, uh, finance, sustainability, and they all need to come and get together and spend a, a good decade or two forging solutions, elegant solutions that you know encompass uh, vertical production from seed to, to distribution and that are expansive across the globe, that are inclusive, that address the needs of fishing uh, interests, because that, that's really, we, we need fishermen on, on our side here. <laughs> aquaculture, I've seen aquaculture <coughs> managers and, and, and fishing captains punch each other in the face. <laughs> I'm serious, over access, and they're two very different cultures. So if you want to develop aquaculture, from a business standpoint, it makes sense to get fishermen on your side. They've already got boats, they've already got knowledge, they're looking for jobs, they're looking for business opportunities. Um, and we need to build a movement. And so hopefully, the, the one thing that we uh, are able to, to convince you of in this talk is that uh, we really need people who maybe right at this moment don't know much about aquaculture to, to inform yourselves about it, inform yourselves about the ocean, um, and you might be surprised about the way that your network or abilities or, or professional skills might be br brought to bear here. We need to do what we've done for land-based agriculture following many mistakes, trial and error. Why go through all the errors in the ocean if, if there's so many of those lessons have already been learned on land? Many of those lessons are being relearned through error, unfortunately, through these stupid aquaculture models. There are many people probably in this room who don't realize that they can help forego the stupid option um, and, and, and shoot for the higher, uh, the higher outcome. That is possible, but it's going to take uh, a catalyst and, and people really uh, uniting around the, uh, that vision, I think, to make it happen. Great. Let's open it to the floor then. Does someone have a question? We got a microphone here. There's a microphone there. closing of the Grand Banks, so this all feels very um, familiar to me. But I have, uh, well, I have so many questions, but the first one is, where do you guys see genetically modified fish fitting into aquaculture in the future? Say again? Where do you see genetically modified fish fitting into aquaculture of the future, or do you? Can, can, that could be applied to all categories, fish, shrimp, can, live house aquaculture. Mm -hmm. Frankenfish. You mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, if, if, I, if I can can respond to that, that um, um, well, we, there's a, there's a lot of things that we don't know yet. But if you look at aquaculture and fish farming in general, um, it's really still in its infancy stages, and there's so much that we can still do without GMO um, uh, that we don't really need it at the moment. Um, and there's so much that we can still do with just selection, breeding, um, and all kinds of other stuff that lessons learned from other industries that we don't really need to go there. It's really hard to avoid, though. Uh, if you um, look at soy, for example, it's hard to buy soy that's not genetically modified. Um, but it's, we don't really need it. So we, from, from, an, from, from AquaSpark's uh, point of view, say, well, if we are not sure what it's going to bring, and if, we, uh, and if we don't really need it, then why invest in it and why stimulate it right now? We best go for low-hanging fruit that's really helpful in the short term. Do you see that there's any risk? If we could, um, sorry, if we sorry. could just stick to one question, thank you. Can I just address that as well, though? I, I, first of all, I'm out of GMOs. That's not going to be part of my business, um, just as a personal value. I agree with uh, Mike that it's totally unnecessary. All of the barriers to development have nothing to do really, you, you can do genetic improvement, you know, Mendelian crossbreeding and all of those things. And, and that's necessary. That's, I'm in that process now with many seaweed species. But I think on land, you have real constraints on output agriculturally. So genetic engineering after really using up all the space and all the inputs, um, there's a business case for it at least. But in the ocean, there are many other technical issues that, can be, that, that need to be addressed first. Uh, that would be my response. Just quickly weigh in on that. The genetic genetically modified organisms. I mean, that runs the gamut from selective breeding to the fancy techniques that you now have to insert, strategically insert certain genetic material into 
whatever species you're trying to enhance to achieve certain goals. But um, it's been done for, uh, for tropical fish. Think of all those fancy goldfish that don't occur anywhere in nature. Uh, and you know, it, again, are you looking at feeding people? Are you growing products? Uh, or, or what is the, the purpose of the, the result that you're trying to achieve? And um, I think we're, we're in a new era of modifying the natural uh, systems to suit our future needs or, or wishes, whatever that might be. And we, we can't turn away from it, it's here. But we certainly can, in the course of shaping the direction of what we consume and what we choose to grow, I think make smarter choices and be really careful about where we place our shots. Okay, we only have 10 minutes left, so let's get to kind of a uh, rapid fire mode. Oh, aside from any advocacy issues of the individual, what advice would you give to individuals regarding purchasing or eating or consuming seafood? There's a great seaweed business, a friend of mine named Toliff Olson uh, up in Maine, Portland area. He's trying to build a network of community seaweed farms, uh, mostly kelp species. His company is called Ocean Approved. Um, Maybe there'll be a competitor someday, but it, I, I'm very inspired by Ocean Approved. I think they're great. Buy seaweed. Less fish, more seaweed. That, that's probably a rapid fire. Broad stroke, but. <laughs> Ask questions. Know what you're buying, but also let the restaurateurs and the market owners know that you're interested. Yeah, and, and don't let them get away with, um, uh, with, with, with an easy answer, where does this fish come from? And then, and then the waiter automatically says, wild caught, of course. Um, which is, well, first of all, in many cases not true, but it's also um, uh, not a really good answer. Um, have well farmed is much better than, than wild caught, but you don't know where it comes from, and a lot of people don't know, and asking that question makes them think about it and makes them um, have an answer next time. My question is actually a really good follow-up to that, which is when we talk about you know stupid aquaculture and responsibly farmed options, what do you think are the most effective ways to inform the public on the questions to ask, to encourage them to know the difference between good farming and bad farming? Because I loved what Eric had to say about, you know, people can be impacted at the point of purchase, and so how do we get them to know what to ask in the first place and to know what's important about fish farming? I think fundamentally you should look at, is this a food choice or is this a food need? Is it is it, are you looking at, um, you know, you just like to eat shrimp or lobster or whatever, uh, or is it something that you really have to have as a food security issue? And I think much of what we're talking about, both in terms of taking from the wild and what is being grown, it's food choice. Food choice, it's not food security. The amount of calories that are actually consumed from either aquaculture or wild-caught creatures is a rel relatively small change in terms of calories. I mean, 80% of the calories come from corn, rice, wheat, and soy that people consume. And so that's calories, but it's nutrition and it's, it's choice. You know, what do you want to eat? Then if, if you want to eat caviar, if you want to eat um, halibut, then you, you say, okay, where did it come from? And <laughs> what's its provenance? Who, who where, where, was it caught? where was it swimming? What did it eat? How many pounds of plants at the bottom of a long and twisted food chain did it take to make the little piece of sushi that is on your, your uh, plate, you know? It's thousands of pounds of plants at the bottom of a long food chain to make a 10-year-old tuna. It's like two pounds or less to make a pound of catfish or tilapia or carp, uh, food security. You, you low on the food chain, plants or the animals that eat plants. We are taking carnivores <laughs> out of the ocean. We don't farm lions and tigers, but even lions and tigers are relatively low on the food chain compared to a halibut or a cod or a tuna. So know those things. 
and make the choices based on what you now are know. And I think we, individual choices can make all the difference in the world, but first, people have to know. And there's a big gap right now in that knowledge. So just, just very quickly, I, it's a great question. Um, in addition to the choices that people individually make and having the information available to individuals, one of the focuses of the program that we are developing at National Aquarium, and it's not unique, and that is to work with um, local restaurant owners, work with local marketplaces, work with local fishermen to help make those connections to help inform them. And there are a lot of really interested um, chefs, there are a lot of really interested market owners who are, who, are just, who are equally seeking the kind of information that many of the people in this room are seeking um, and can be kind of a wholesale uh, 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 purveyor of information and make, and make those choices available. Good. Yeah, I've got a, a good segue as well, I suppose, because on that whole choices issue, I've drastically reduced my consumption of seafood over the last few years. And, um, quite proud of that because it does taste very good, a lot of it. Um, but I suppose my reasons were the c concerns around plastics in the ocean and the transference of persistent pollutants up the food chain. So my question is, is there a, an opening for some large scale campaigning and education and activating people to reduce their consumption of wild caught seafood based on these health concerns? So. I, I, I don't want to dominate here, but for, first of all, I would, and you don't have to answer this, but I would rhetorically say if you're reducing your consumption of seafood, it's in favor of what? Um, I think that, frankly, one of the underlying values of helping people to enjoy sustainable seafood, help people enjoy sustainable aquaculture product, is that they appreciate the relationship between healthy oceans and healthy waterways and their food supply. And, and frankly, I think that as long as we're doing this in the right way. You heard Mike say, you know, if, you, if your choice is I give up fish for chicken or beef, well, you, ha you haven't done the world any favors. Yes, um, you have. But yes, you have. <laughs> oh, yes, you have. But That's another panel. <laughs> but so glad I could be contentious. <laughs> oh, I, I, yes, you I, have. I, I, would, I would challenge us to look at some of the underlying environmental impacts Seaweed. associated with um, feed diversion <laughs> ratios and the like. Um, but if you know, if, if local communities are growing shellfish in local waters, they have an economic incentive to clean up those systems. If they don't, then as Sylvia said earlier, nobody owns it, nobody's going to step up for it. But if they see economic value associated with healthy local waters, if they see economic value associated with healthy oceans, um, then we are doing the environment a favor by engaging communities in a more meaningful and holistic way. I just want to, uh, sorry, go on, sorry. The, the, uh, the, just a small addition. If, if, it, if, you, if you then eat seafood and go uh, a little bit lower in the food chain, um, as Sylvia said, and you, you, you can still eat something that's really, really tasty, mm. but get something that's really well farmed instead of wild caught, because wild caught, as you point out, you don't know what it ate, um, uh, plastic. It, it could have swum off the coast of Fukushima yesterday. You don't know. Um, well farmed is a much better option. Um, it's just uh, not so easy to find out what that is and where it came from. And then it should be fish that didn't eat fish. And voting with your dollar, obviously, is supporting those that are doing it correctly. Sorry? Voting with your dollar, obviously, supporting yes. those yes. that are doing it correctly. And voting with your fork. Absolutely. Yes. Voting with your fork. <laughs> I, I just want to speak to the issues of, again, seaweed. Um, with regards to pollutants and health, most of the seaweed grown in the world is in uh, East Asia. A lot of it is grown in very dirty uh, uh, coastal areas, very populated, a lot of indus heavy industry. Seaweed takes on what's around it more than fish, for example. Um, you know, it, its leaves, lamina, are what that it doesn't derive its nutrients from roots. It, it's the water going past it. So if you have heavy metals, it's going to clean those up, but it's going to end up you're not going to want to eat it, as, as Sylvia yeah. said. So the way that I, I think about it is, well, let's farm in really clean water. So northwestern Mexico has no nuclear reactors, no offshore oil, no major population, really, no major freshwater pollution issues. Um, and we want to couple the proper siting of our farms with a real intensive monitoring of all types of different toxins um, and to be able to tell our 
consumers, you can trust this product. And I think that that's part of the problem with the commoditization of seafood is that every fish of a certain species is essentially the same value. Well, they're not all swimming in the same water, and they're not all caught in the same way, and they're not caught by the same people. So if we can start to shine a light on that supply chain and actually do some testing, say, of mercury for tuna or uh, heavy metals and seaweeds, I think that we can help the consumer make the right choices and vote with their dollar better. I just want to yeah. jump in one very quick question. Um, could, you, could the panelists just recommend a fish that we might not know about that we can feel good about eating? That we do you eat I have fish? a fish that hasn't been developed yet that I think would make a great aquaculture product, and that's pompano, which is an omnivore. Um, and it's really tasty, and you eat it in Florida. There's a Pacific species that a friend of mine wanted to culture, but then the economic collapse happened, and he wasn't able to uh, work on it. But that's a real question here. We focused on things that people already eat, which is logical if you are going to have to do this aquaculture thing that's so hard. But there's a whole category of species that haven't been developed yet that are actually quite tasty and really nutritious and forego a lot of these problems. We need to expand the portfolio. There are 25,000 different kinds of fish, freshwater and marine, and it comes down to catfish, tilapia, and carp right now is the best choices for these reasons. Plant eating, grow fast, don't mind crowding, they're hardy, oh, and they taste good, or at least taste all right. Depends on the onion or the lemon or the garlic or whatever you put on, just like chicken. You know, it's not chicken, it's what you put on it that really makes it whatever. The thing about wild caught versus the farmed is, you know, look through that lens. What grows fast? What tastes good? What takes energy from the sun through plants? Eat the plants, that's the best deal, or eat the fish that eat the plants. We don't think about the age of the fish in the ocean because they're free. Orange roughy takes 30 years to mature. They may be 100 years old by the time they reach your plate and it takes 10 minutes to eat them. Come on, that's not a good deal. To, to raise salmon, that's not a good deal either, not just because of the amount of food, but the age. You know, three years would be minimum to make a salmon from an egg to a plate size, and that's only when you, you know, give them all the favors that you can. But in the wild, we're talking six years or more. Uh, how many six-year-old chickens have you had recently? The reason it's a better deal to have chickens or cows or pigs or other things that we grow on the land than taking a wild fish out of the ocean. Tunas take bluefins 10 to 14 years to mature. That, how many groceries are in a 10-year-old kid? I mean, and how many fish have gone into making the 10-year-old tuna that comes to your plate? And we're talking thousands of pounds of plants way below where the, the fish are that the big fish consume. So, Knowing these things really makes it realistic to look at the great number of options, freshwater and marine. The Amazon has lots of plant-eating fish that we haven't even thought about possible targets, both for consumption or for raising products or for the aquarium trade around the world. That is big business. Okay, very quickly. Don't, don't forget shellfish. Oh, and yeah. it's That's as right. important where and how it's grown as it is what. Yeah, you're right. right? Yeah, the, 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 the pompano is a really great example, but it's also, the people forget, uh, tilapia doesn't always have a great name, but if you tilapia, tilapia just is a really peculiar fish, it tastes after what it ate. So if you had tilapia that doesn't taste well, um, you blame the farmer, um, and not the fish. Uh, all right, last question. Thank you, I've really enjoyed this panel. It's been great to hear all of your expertise and insights on this really important issue. My question is about the policy and regulatory structure. It seems like most of the aquaculture is happening outside the U.S. and having worked on it here in the U.S., we have such a complicated, um, conflicting regulatory and policy structure, both at the state and national level. So what sorts of regulatory reforms or policy solutions do you think are needed to help advance more sustainable aquaculture here in the U.S.? Okay, very quickly, please. Uh, so uh, there are lots of them. There are management plans being developed for federal waters under the auspices of uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, they need to move forward. Um, in state waters, um, some of these are regulatory streamlining efforts between federal uh, natural resource authorities, local planning and zoning, and, and, and state environmental regulatory 
uh, concerns. When we were, when I was in Maryland DNR, trying to advance oyster aquaculture in the Chesapeake Bay, we worked extensively across those levels of government to streamline the permitting process. We just have to do a heck of a lot more of that, and we have to make government officials at local, state, and federal levels understand that it's important. Well, I'd like to weigh in on this because I think streamlining the existing policies is certainly in order. Much that now is on the books came into being years ago before we knew what we now know. But one thing that we now know that is not being properly taken into account, uh, I think, is the value of the ocean in its own right, not just as a place to grow things, not just as a place to extract things, not just as waterways for shipping and all that, but the intrinsic value of keeping ocean as ocean. The most important thing, that the greatest value that the ocean delivers to us isn't in terms of what we take out or as a place to put stuff that we don't want nearby. It's our existence. We need to protect above all else the processes that we have heretofore taken for granted and regard, regarded as free. And, and that, that goes right down to what are fish worth. Their value in the ocean alive has an importance that transcends just pounds of meat or products that we can take out or livelihoods. It's our life, our, our existence that we have to, now that we know that the ocean governs the way the world functions, all those basic cycles, nitrogen cycle, the carbon cycle, oxygen, you know, if you like to breathe, you'll listen up because it's the ocean at the end. So there's this temptation right now to move into the ocean. We've conquered the land. We've got gardens and cities and whatever it is. The land is pretty well buttoned up with human occupation. So now let's move into the ocean. I say, OK, but do it with the utmost care in recognizing that there's a cost to everything. The ocean is not free just to put things out there to have open ocean aquaculture, there's a cost that we need to account for. And everyone should be weighing in on this and not just let industry move into the ocean as if it's okay. We're, that we're running it's out of free. time. So uh, use your voice and your intelligence in these ways to let your voice be heard. Thanks very much to our panelists, they're excellent. Great way to end it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.